YouTube family, click the link and subscribe to our channel as we give you the latest thoughts and news around Europe. Vamos! The European football is in full mode and today's episode goes around the old continent to discuss the latest news that deserve extra attention. What do we make of Barcelona's dreary opener at Spotify Camp Nou? A new playlist, perhaps? Neymar is looking good under Galtier, but is there any friction between him and Mbappé? How about Serie A? Juventus looking good last night against Sassuolo with Fideo Angel Di Maria got things going for the old lady. Meanwhile, Ronaldo. Is there a club out there that actually wants him? Michael Lahoud, Jonathan Johnson make up our three amigos. Que golazo begins right now. Hey everybody, welcome to Kigo Lasso. Thank you so much for being part of the family. YouTube.com forward slash Kigo Lasso. We're nearly there. 20,000 subscribers. Stop making me say that. Stop making me say we're nearly there. I want to hit it. I want to hit it before we hit September. Nearly to 20,000 subscribers. And it's thanks to all of you and thanks to our amazing team. Michael Lahoud, how are you, buddy? I'm doing really well. Finally slept off the horror show that was United over the weekend. And milestone, personal milestone for me, I think this is my 50th K Golasso episode. So just. All right, just Michael LaHood, the 5 0. Congrats, my friend. Plenty more to come, I'm sure, as also we'll see plenty more losses for Manchester United. <laughs> so I can't wait to get into that. Uh, but this is about the continent. So I promise everybody, Man United fans specifically, we're not going to hit that. Hey, Vacation Man is back. Sardinia <laughs> looked beautiful. JJ, how are you, buddy? Hey there, guys. Yeah, doing good, thanks. Uh, obviously, had a great time away on holiday. Slightly disappointed to be back in uh, Paris. It's not quite Sardinia, but uh, you know what? I'll make do. You, got, you guys are brightening up my day. That's the most important thing. But... I'm really not appreciating the Diego Carlos news dampening my spirits just as I get back. Brother, I, I may need therapy uh, since that's happened. It's just like, it's the villa curse, man. Doesn't get hurt. Gets hurt for eight days in his entire career. Match day two for Aston Villa. He's eight out for seven. It's just ridiculous. Mm. <laughs> ridiculous. But we wish you all the best to our Brazilian mountain. Hopefully he'll come back stronger than ever. But here's our trio including myself, Michael LaHood, Jonathan Johnson. Welcome, everybody. As I mentioned, this is our Continental Roundup episode where we don't even touch the Premier League. Let's talk about the other big leagues in Europe. And let's begin, everybody, with La Liga as it opened this weekend, of course. Barcelona with a dreary stalemate against Rayo Vallecano, which, by the way, I give them full credit. I thought they were really excellent at frustrating the camp. Now, faithful, I was there, by the way, boys, and... For the first half, we were also maybe going to get a big storm. And I was like, am I going to get a storm, rain, and no goals at Barcelona? <laughs> that would have been terrible. But regardless, Barcelona drew uh, their opening game in La Liga. And, you know, Lewandowski didn't do that well. But as soon as Aubameyang came on, as soon as Frankie de Jong came on, the players they're supposedly meant to be getting rid of, Barcelona looked much better. So I guess my question begins with this, by the way. Okay. And it's a big one. And it's kind of one that I stole from Chiringuito. So I'll bring it up here. Let's begin with you, Michael LaHood. Aubameyang, is he better suited for Barcelona than Lewandowski? I think it's a bit early to just one game. You can't say that for a new player. But based on that sample size, you might be scratching your head if you're Xavi and Laporta. Because this is what I see in that Barcelona team. Aubameyang has the flexibility to drift wide and function as a winger or be a central figure. Lewandowski, he needs service. When you're playing in this Barcelona team, you don't have wingers who cross the ball. They get to the end line, and they want to cut it back. Or you have goal-scoring wingers who want to go. Dembele wants to cut in his left foot. Shoot, Rafinha, goal-scoring winger. Lewandowski is going to have to adapt his game, and that's going to take time. He was more provider in that game than he was goal-scoring threat. Aubameyang can be both, and that suits him better for Barcelona. I think as well, the thing to bear in mind with this, uh, at the risk of, of getting a bit boring about it, Lewandowski's brought in as like the champion, like one of a number of big name signings this summer in a summer where Barca have revamped themselves. Aubameyang came in and it was almost like 
you know, we can't really lose with this guy. Anything we get out of him is a bonus given what's just gone on uh, with Arsenal and what was happening with him at international level at that time. And I feel that the pressure is such on Lewandowski to be the saviour for this Barca right now and basically be exactly the same player he was for Bayern. You know, that 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 sort of chemistry, that, that sort of golden touch in front of goal, it doesn't come overnight. I mean, sure, I'm expecting him to score plenty of goals this season for Barca, but it's going to take... You know, probably the best part of two seasons for him to really develop the same kind of chemistry that we saw with him and his Bayern teammates. And I feel that there is such pressure on Lewandowski to deliver immediately and to be that hero. I mean, you look at some of the players that this Barca situation has chewed up at the moment. Memphis Depay, like 12 months ago, he's being like celebrated as like the guy. He's probably not even going to be registered for the squad now. Frankie de Jong as well. I mean, honestly, it's crazy. The, 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 the Barca situation is so... I mean, I mean, it's so charged. There's so much at stake that for me, I feel like Lewandowski, if he scores a couple of goals and has what would normally be considered a fairly decent first season, I don't think it's going to be enough for Barca. I think he needs to hit between 20 and 30 goals and for Barca to enjoy immediate success for, for him to really be considered like, uh, you know, the, the player that, that Barca went out and wanted to get. Remember, this is a Barcelona team that it's been a while since they've had that focal point up top. Luis Suarez uh, was one of those players for them. But I, I even think back to Samuel Atto, a player who had La Liga pedigree as well. So it's not out of the, the realm of possibility for Barcelona to adapt. But there's just too many players in that locker room, too many players with big personalities, too many players who are could be out-and-out out starters throughout the rest of Europe. But I'm not even worried about the front line for Barcelona because they have depth. Look at who they can bring off the bench. You said Frankie de Jong, Aubameyang, Ansu Fati. These are players that could walk into most La Liga teams and become out-and-out starters, if not the main man. I'm worried about their lack of depth at the back. Araujo, not a right back. He got torched. I thought Alvaro Garcia should have scored. He brought his dribbling boots and left his, his scoring boots back in Madrid. And when I look at Christensen, he looks shaky. So they're going to have to go and fix that situation before they do anything else. Yeah, JJ, so what's the latest on that? I know we had Fabrizio Romano uh, yesterday on the show and we were touching upon a few things. To Michael's point, the right-back uh, situation is somewhere that Barcelona is looking for. Man City apparently are asking a lot for Bernardo Silva. I have no idea where Barcelona is getting this money from. Marcos Alonso remains a target. It, what's the latest there? De Jong, of course, we haven't even touched upon. Because to Michael's point, there is talent, but it's probably in the places where Barcelona don't even need it. They need it way more defensively what's the latest there yeah, I mean, it doesn't really seem like there's been like a, an actual like strategy that Barca are kind of following in terms of like building up the squad and, and replenishing their options. It's more just that they're going after basically any sort of big or semi-recognizable names that they can find, bringing them in, basically making this team as marketable as possible. I mean, it's almost what we've seen from PSG over the last couple of years in, in chasing Champions League success. Obviously, there's differences, but it, it's almost like, a, you know, the, expecting a gaggle of star names. To, to just go and basically ball out and, and win everything. And we know that that doesn't, you know, automatically happen. Uh, and it feels a bit stupid at times when you look at some of the players that are, you know, sort of having to, to make do with time from the bench at the moment. Mike mentioned Ansu Fati. I mean, Barca are like one of the clubs in the world who genuinely could have sold, uh, you know, a couple of uh, players, brought some money in, uh, you know, and, and look back into into La Masia, their youth academy, and actually brought through the next generation of stars. Now it kind of feels like they're looking, I mean, sure, you know, they, they've been looking at Alonso for a while. You know, it took a while for them to get Christensen and, uh, and Kessie over the line. But, you know, are those guys necessarily the players that they absolutely needed in order to, to rebuild this squad? I mean, it feels like madness. And now we're talking about Bernardo Silva. Like, honestly, I'm asking myself, why would Bernardo Silva be looking at Barca, <laughs> yeah. wanting Jeez. to put himself under this kind of pressure? Because, <laughs> uh, I mean, Silva, Silva still has a role to play at City. Sure, you could make yeah. the argument that he's won pretty much all that he could win with City with the exception of the Champions League and whether City can you know find it within themselves to go that extra step once more uh, and try and challenge for the Champions League again I guess what you know time will tell this season but really if you're City do you trust that Barca are going to be able to honor that you know that kind of money which you know we're talking about the best part of 100 million euros here for me it seems you know ridiculous and we're still talking about other holes in the squad that need to be filled 
it feels to me like Barca need to actually approach this transfer window pragmatically. And the chance to do that has already gone out the window with half the business, well, more than half the business that's been done already. So for me, regardless of who they bring in between now and the end of the window, there's been no coherent strategy in place whatsoever. So it wouldn't surprise me if even more holes crop up in this squad between now and the end of the season. Yeah, all the off-field antics are impacting uh, the -the on-the-field antics. And Man City has every right to just be all right, you want Bernardo Silva? Let's see what you can do because we're not going to give him. Feeling. By the way, I'm a huge fan of Frank Kessie, massive fan. He looked so lost. He looked yeah. so lost in this. Now, I, I know that it's going to take time. And to your point, I just don't think he's a Barca player. All right, let's move on. Let's stick on La Liga, by the way. Uh, there were a lot of surprises this weekend, uh, as there always is. Not always our predictions are exactly correct. So I wanted to ask the boys just one thing to take away. One thing to take away from this weekend that you thought, oh, wow, I wasn't expecting that. Jonathan Johnson, you go first, buddy. Yeah, well, uh, I, I mean, are we, are we talking about things that surprised us aside from Manuel Pellegrini's like, <laughs> grand, grand, granddaddy ball control? That is some very, very that is neat some sedan touches. stuff, buddy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. It is. Uh, it is for, for not phenomenal. No, on, honestly, like joking apart, uh, you know, Pellegrini's ball skills on the side of the pitch look great, but the team on the pitch looked fantastic as well. Mm. Obviously, I'm I'm hoping for for big things from Betis this coming season. Obviously, last season was was fantastic with the Copa our race success but i don't know i just i just feel like this season that you know the the stars are aligning and if they can keep the this pace that they've set for themselves in the opening day uh you know i think they really could be a champions league contender because i Mm. i i'm not as convinced as i was a few months ago that all of the big boys are going to be back at it this season in terms of qualifying for the champions league yeah i agree with you i I thought the likes of a nabil fakir was a standout player created both two out of the three goals magical left foot looking like the player they signed from Lyon and captain Lyon and also was part of that French national team in 2018 but the game that caught my eye was I think twofold Osasuna getting the upset victory over Sevilla but how about Atletico Madrid yesterday 3-0 and it was a game that was so odd because Getafe had chances and for Diego Simeone the chances came out of what he loves best defensive actions Atleti through João Felix and Alvaro Morata looked like an assassin in the final third, getting two left-footed goals. When have we said that about Alvaro Morata? Looking like the player that was at Juventus when they made that Champions League final run. And when Alvaro Morata plays with more of a creative second forward, a la the likes of a Carlos Tevez when he was thriving at Juventus, that is when you get the best out of him. But Diego Simeone will be kind of perturbed at how easily Getafe were breaking them down in the press. Is yeah. he is he not pl- is he not playing for that United move though, Morata? <laughs> ah, well, you know, no. after this week, that moves off the table. Is anybody playing for a United move? <laughs> I don't know about that. Maybe it's a bet that they are, everybody loses. Here's one for you uh, uh, regarding Atletico Madrid, uh, and it kind of you know ties within what both of you were saying. One, I think finally patience is going to be a virtue here, and I think Joao Felix, this is going to be a mm. season. I think he's going to do pretty well this year as well. I think that finally he gets La Liga. Finally get Simeone's uh, strategy. He's not old. He's a, he's still young. And I think that this is the season where he can balance everything from, you know, European football, of course, to trying to win La Liga once again. I think this is going to be a good season for him. Of course, make sure that he stays healthy. My only surprise uh, weekend is literally what you said, JJ. I think this is going to be the season where that fight for the top four, it's going to be really interesting. And a lot well, of part- teams that we think are, are not going to be, uh, you know, the, the, the usual contenders the usual suspects are not exactly going to be running away with it well staying on that theme one of the surprise results as mike mentioned was sevilla getting beaten by osasuna and i was looking i was i was looking (laughs) through that sevilla team and it i mean i I don't want to be too harsh on them at the beginning of a season but it doesn't strike me as the same, you know, sort of ilk as Sevilla teams. I mean, the the aforementioned Diego Carlos has gone, Kunde has gone. There's a lot of players out there that are not losing. And Monchi's a magician, but, you know, you're trying to get Champions League. You're possibly trying to even get first and second. You got to do a little bit more. By the way, I mean, I was there. Rayo Vallecano just returning Mm. to La Liga. They, I mean, I know it's the opening weekend. They looked all right. They could have won that game. Like, so there's, there's a lot of competition, so... You know, we'll have to wait and see. All right. Well, that was La Liga. Let's move on here to League uh, Jonathan Johnson. League uh, Michael LaHood are very interested in finding out <laughs> what is going on with... First of all, 
I'm getting really angry as a South American because Brazil's depth is just stupid. I'm looking at highlights of Anthony looking amazing. Of course, Rafinha will get it going at some point. Gabriel Jesus reincarnated with Arsenal. Mm -hmm. And now Neymar Jr., Jonathan Johnson, five goals, three assists in all competitions, including the Trophée de Champions. Like, what's going on? Is he just loving live under Galtier? Or is, is he being placed in better positions? What's going on? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a good question, but I, I I think really at the end of the day, the the crux of I mean the issue at PSG, if we can call it that, is literally Neymar and and Messi have returned to to PSG, you know, sort of focused on 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 this new era under Galtier uh, and Campos as well. Let's not forget Luis Campos, mm. uh, you know, and you know whether it's because it's World Cup year or not. You know, when they want to play, when they want to turn it on, they can, and that's exactly what they're doing, and. He wouldn't like to, he won't like to hear this kid in Mbappe, but perhaps him being out for the first couple of matches this season with the domestic suspension in the Trophée de Champion, then the injury that kept him out against Clermont. Sure, I mean, I think it's made him a bit stressed, a bit, you know, wary mm. that uh, Neymar and Messi have made a fast start to the season. But also at the same time, it's made it easier, you know, to get Neymar and Messi on that same page. And Mbappe was always going to be the least troublesome of the three to get into form, given the way that he's carried PSG over the last couple of years. So I personally, I don't believe that there's too much to the tension other than the fact that Mbappe is frustrated that he hasn't been there for the first two games of the season, hasn't already, you know, risen to the top of the scoring charts like Neymar has, uh, you know, and it is perhaps feeding the tension there a little bit. Sure, I think there's definitely an issue to, to resolve with Kylian Mbappe and penalties. And the same goes for the French national team as well, because he just, he's not great at them. Let's be honest. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, you, 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 I mean, it's a, it's a very harsh thing to, to judge. That's why he on, didn't but... <laughs> argue with Neymar that much. When Neymar was like, no, nah, I got this. But Kylian was like, okay, fine. Because he knows that he's not that great at it. <laughs> no, he's JJ. not, but all... Sorry, go, on. Go, go on, mate, go on. No, uh, just my thoughts on it is, look, we, we've seen teams that have big personalities and, and typically how it plays out through the course of a season is there's there's a tipping point and there's a blow up point with this PSG team who seems to be firing on all cylinders. You mentioned Messi, Neymar looking focused. How do you see this tension with he and Mbappe and how do you see this like literally playing out in the longer run? Because there's a lot of pressure on this team to still deliver even though they're getting early goals and getting And wins. there's a lot of football still to be played, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, we don't know how the season's going to pan out, especially post-World Cup as well. Uh, but let's be honest. I mean, the, the situation is quite simple. Are PSG a stronger team when you've got Neymar, Messi and Mbappe in form? Of course they are. So, you know, the fact that they've already got two of the three sort of singing from the same hymn sheet to, to start with, you know, it's a very positive thing. And like I said before, I don't think Mbappe is going to take that long to really, you know, find uh, find his feet. Uh, you know, he he's always in very good shape. He's missed, yeah, a couple of uh, weeks since the end of the season in terms of like competitive match action or semi-competitive, depending how you consider the Trophée de Champion. But really, I don't think it's necessarily something that I would worry will undermine PSG for the entirety of the season. And I think the fact that Luis Campos and Galtier have run PSG very well since arriving uh you know suggests that there's not going to be you know they're not going to allow any of these kind of issues to to derail the team uh you know for for much longer than a match or two so anything that had to be said uh you know i think would have been taken care of internally immediately but like i said i don't think it was maybe everything that people were blowing it up to be there's been this you know assumption that mbappe is basically the de facto sporting director since he extended his contract and as much as it's as much as it's a fun story you know i don't think that he would have wanted somebody like Neymar out of the club instead I think he's probably a bit frustrated that he's had to spend the last 12 to 18 months bailing PSG out when Neymar hasn't felt like playing mm. uh, and now he's seen him turn it on without him on the pitch yeah no it's a very good point we just want drama JJ yeah, that's yeah. all we want we want gossip we want telling <laughs> you, you, stories yes <laughs> we do <laughs> <laughs> that's all I want at the end of hey how did Renato Sanchez get in the end by the way how did he look in that when it looks, uh, I mean, honestly, I think it's a, it's a shrewd signing for PSG. Mm. It gives them a bit of midfield depth, and it's a player that Galtier and Campos know well, so they know exactly what he can bring to the team, what not to expect from him. Got a goal, uh, you know, to, to, to open up his account. Uh, looks to have a very nice uh, understanding with Nuno Mendes already. So, I, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a good move. And, you know, with Vitinha as well, I think that, that PSG... Mm. 
midfield is starting to look pretty baller now. You know, obviously we know Marco Verratti, what he can and, and can't do, mostly what he can do because he's a phenomenal player, but there's been an over-reliance on him over the last couple of years. So for PSG to suddenly find a bit of midfield depth, they're now potentially moving on Paredes as well, Kjellher. So, you know, we could see PSG add even more players to the mix between now and the end of the transfer window, but it already looks like at least the, the midfield has been given a facelift and Sergio Ramos back from the dead yeah. as well, playing a role in defense. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, and I think Ramos, when he's on the pitch and able to play and actually bring something to the team, I think his leadership then comes, you know, to to the fore even more because when you've got a player of that experience, yeah. you know, he's not going to let any sort of, you know, silly uh, nonsense between Mbappe and Neymar, whatever might have happened, uh, you know, uh, last for, for too long. You know, guys like him, guys like Messi, they know how to, uh, you know, handle those sort of issues within a dressing room. And I think that will also give PSG a bit of added stability. Perhaps the the, the thing that people are most frustrated about so far this season is that PSG actually seem to be addressing the things that have been, you know, sort of killing them season after season for the last couple of years. Yeah, absolutely. But it will be really a test when we see how they do eventually in the Champions League. Of course, that trophy they still need to buy. One thing that I learned from the last dance was how Phil Jackson managed, uh, you know, from a human perspective, Michael yeah. Jordan, Scottie Pippen, the same thing with Kobe Bryant and Shaq uh, with the Lakers. Galtier's biggest job is to handle that squad because there's a lot of egos, a lot of star power. And it's just about making sure that it's balanced. All right. Uh, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we got plenty more in our continental uh, roundup, by the way. We'll talk some Serie A. Have we changed our minds about Juventus? Because none of us here picked them to win Scudetto. And we'll talk about Cristiano Ronaldo. Yes, not from a Manchester United perspective, God forbid, but from a European perspective. Let's see how they do. We'll do final thoughts, and that will be it. Okay, well, that's a continental roundup. Michael Aoud, LME, Jonathan Johnson. We'll be right back. We found your daughter. She's alive. Mister? It's mommy. Four years is a long time. Welcome home. I think something's going on with Esther. She seemed different. Since she got back, there's constant lying. There's outbursts of anger. Orphan First Kill, rated R, streaming August 19th on Paramount+. Plus. Welcome back, everybody, to our Continental Roundup here at Gigo Lasso. Hey, by the way, as we are taping, just letting you know that Champions League, uh, the playoff matches are, are holding. So we'll talk a, lot, a little bit more about that later in the week. We got Rangers PSV. That should be a cracker. Yeah. Traps on Spore, by the way. Uh, Copenhagen, Dynamo Kiev, Benfica. There's so many matches. But we'll talk about that more once it gets a little bit closer. So that's why, you know, we don't want to talk about it right now. We'll talk about it after the first leg. But let's talk about... Juventus, everybody. Uh, a good win against Sassuolo. Everybody looked ready. Dusan Vlaovic got off to the start. Angel Di Maria got things going with that great goal. Uh, obviously, he didn't mean it, everybody. Calm down. He just, But you know what? Fortune <laughs> favors the brave, so whatever. He did get hurt, though, so that's a problem. But apparently, Allegri says he's going to be out for about 10 days. But I wanted to ask the boys here, have we changed our minds about uh, Juventus in terms of how they're going to end up at the end of the season, Michael LaHood? What do you think? I have a little bit. I think that if you can keep an Angel Di Maria, I think he is going to be the most important addition to the team. He gives them the X factor. Right. His movement off the ball it was first class. On that goal, he can play as a winger. He can play centrally, but he has that freedom playing in the second striker role, which we've seen him play at PSG when he was thriving and also in previous teams. Now, what I, what I am kind of still questioning is – there's a lot of focus and a lot of onus on them to get that partnership between Benucci and Brenner. That is where their success in the season is going to lie. Attacking-wise, they will score goals. Vlahovic looks like the player from Fiorentina playing centrally and not having to occupy a lot of the same spaces that he and Morata both did last season. I think they got in each other's way quite often. But this team looks like a team that's settled, looks like the team that has Allegri's identity and imprint, but in the back, We'll see how they do. Those two center backs, that's going to be where their title hopes lie. Yeah, I agree that, uh, you know, they do need to look at their defense a little bit more. Uh, and I think as well, there's now some scope for them to rebuild the midfield a bit, especially if Rabio completes his move to, to United, which 
coincidentally, I'm uh, I'm very uh, curious to see how that plays out. Veronique Rabiot in the the Manchester United boardroom that definitely <laughs> gave me a couple of hours of uh, amusement yeah. while I was on holiday. There's a video <laughs> meme of this guy who's putting like fries in a pan full of oil and it just goes all on fire. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's all I'm thinking. <laughs> oh <laughs> man, no, but I mean, ult- ultimately for me, Juve. I still feel that they're a bit short of potentially mm. being Skeletor winning material. I agree with Mike. I mean, yeah, maybe I feel a little bit more positive about them, but I still think that there are other teams who I would expect, uh, you know, to, to to be finishing ahead of them in the in the title race. So, I mean, we'll we'll see how the the next couple of uh, weeks go. But I've I've not seen enough from Juve yet to to stick them down as my favourites for the title. Uh, it wasn't a surprising victory for Juventus, a good one, of course, but I'm sure there were some things that were surprising this weekend. Uh, Michael, anything that surprised you in City A this weekend? Uh, we got to go with one of the headliners, Inter Milan. They had to earn it. They had to wait late on to get the three points, and they will be just bolstered by the fact that Romelu Lukaku got off the mark and got off early. This is why they signed him, a player who... As a striker, you know you just need to see that ball go in the back of the net any which way you can. But let me remind you, early last season for Chelsea, the ball went in the back of the net, and then the goals dried up. Then he started feeling himself a little bit. I think he'll have some of that tempered being back at Inter and back in Serie A. The player that I still think will be their decisive player, though, will be Lautaro Martinez. This guy's the real deal. He gets the assist on the game-winning goal, and he'll need to do that and more moving forward, but it was all about getting the three points, given the fact that AC Milan got three big points of their own. Yeah, for me, I think the thing that it surprised me the most over the weekend was Napoli making a fast start. Now, I know that shouldn't yeah. be too surprising yeah. given the way they did the same last campaign, but given the players that they've lost over the summer, the likes of Dries Mertens, uh, Kalidou Koulibaly, uh, you know, I didn't know if they would be in a position to really hit the ground running, but 5-2 win away at Verona, I don't know if that says more about Napoli or, or less uh, you know, about Verona, given how they're uh, how they played last season but I think that's a very encouraging start for Spalletti's men uh, and I, th- I think that puts them in a much more positive position because I know a couple of weeks ago we were debating whether Napoli might fall short of Champions League qualification entirely uh, and I think that if they can you know maintain this kind of form uh, you know and then avoid dropping some of the, the the points that they dropped sort of around the mid part of last season when they lost Aussie men uh, you know they could be a dark horse uh, you know for nipping into the Champions League spots. I definitely wouldn't put them down as title favorites for the moment, but I feel a bit more positive about Napoli after that performance than I did before the season got underway. How about Victor Osman, by the way? Yeah. I believe our producer Nat is going to maybe post out the tweet that he put the goal after scoring, removing his mask and doing a little bit of trolling. I loved it. I think Victor Osman, <laughs> now that he's back, feeling healthy, feeling ready. Yes, Napoli have lost a lot of key players, including, of course, Dries Merton Koulibaly. But this man right here, I mean, he's going to be classic, I think. And I think, you know, if he has a good season, they have an even better chance of uh, getting Europe uh, top four, et cetera. By the way, Tangu, Tangu and Dumbele closing in apparently on a loan, at least from Tottenham per our mm. Fabrizio. Got, got, so ne- got Neves on his way as well. That's wow. right. So it should be a very, uh, you know, we'll have to see about Napoli, but they, he w- they would definitely be my surprise as well. All right, let's uh, wrap everything up here with uh, the favorite man we love to talk about. He says sarcastically, Cristiano Ronaldo. All right. Well, <laughs> we're not going to talk about it, Mike. Not the game. Because, no. I mean, no. it, you know, it was just disastrous. Absolutely <laughs> disastrous. Oh, it was but disastrous, then, de- de- depending on, yeah. on which, su- which side well, of the Redford fence. Had a good oh, my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah the time. bees. So, yeah, but we're not going to talk about that. It's not. It's our continental thing. I want to more focus on the fact that, obviously, reports are now coming out. Something that we already knew because he wanted it to leave anyway is that Ronaldo may be allowed to leave Man U if Eric Ten Hag, you know, backs the exit. You know, right now, United, bottom of the Premier League table, uh, losing the first two games, whatever. Ronaldo's uh, future at the club is uncertain. The Portuguese striker, uh, you know, he's not for sale, has a year left on his contract. But United have the option of extending by another 12 months. Of course, that's not going to happen. So obviously, we need that situation here. Where would you see him going? Because it's all very well that Ronaldo might get the green light from United to leave. But is there any club in Europe, Michael LaHood, that really could do this? We've already heard that Bayern Munich are not going to do this. 
Yeah. Right. I don't think Atletico Madrid, even their fans are showing up at the one the <laughs> Metropolitano not to accept this. Where could he go? I said on HQ when this news first came out that he wanted to leave was, you know what? You want Champions League? You want to be renowned as a hero? Just go back to sporting, man. What, mm -hmm. what, what? The problem is they can't afford it. So could Ronaldo maybe say, look, I'll, I'll lower everything just to make this happen. Where do you see this happening? Where could he go? I'm going to go further east. Okay. It's a place where a lot of players go when they have not a lot of options or they're like, hey, this is a safe haven. I'm going to get Champions League football. Turkey. Go to Turkey. You get paid in cash. You get paid in whatever. And it's all under the tit. No, I was kidding. Uh, no, I, I could see him. I agree with you about sporting. That, that's really the romanticized version of it. Yeah. We'll see how it works out financially. But I, I really do think Turkey could be a good landing spot for him because the pressure to deliver – will be not as much as if he was to go back to a place like sporting. I mean, he will still be revered as an absolute icon being in a place like the Turkish Super League. But this is getting bad, and this is getting worse fast. For United, if you're Ten Hag, the look of exasperation, and I already gave my rant to Heath over the weekend, so I'm going to hold it back. But the look of exasperation on Ten Hag's face tells me that he's in the board right now saying, get rid of this guy any which way because it's destroying the team and player and club. The relationship has gone from just just not amicable anymore. I don't even know the legal terms for when people get into a divorce. <laughs> but um, Yeah, <laughs> dog shit, I think, is uh, the actual legal term. Yeah. But the kids are going to have extra Christmas yeah. presents, basically, is what's happening right now. Jonathan yeah. Johnson, what do you think? Where's he going? Uh, you, you know, you've ruled out Atleti earlier. I actually hmm. wonder, I mean, we see the rumors at the moment linking United with a move for Cunha. I mean, surely if that happens with Atleti holding on for the minimum free release clause, which I think is what, above 50 million, surely hmm. then that gives Atleti the money to actually bring in Ronaldo that, you know, for a season or two. And if Simeone is really... The fans don't really, want it though, JJ. The fans but, are like... Yeah, but, yeah, but, if, but, if, but if Simeone wants it, if he's convinced he can do something matter. with Ronaldo, right. then it doesn't matter. Mm, that's true, Mike. Simi Simi Simeone is the club. <laughs> he is the club. Mm. Uh, renowned to be one of the greatest managers La Liga has ever seen, which is a very fair argument, actually. Mike, what do you think about that? Ronaldo I, to Atletico Madrid. <laughs> I, I want to believe, but after you just win 3-0, Anton Griezmann getting off the score sheet, you're inviting more drama and problems into your locker room in a way that, look, if this was – if this conversation was getting to the point where it is now, maybe before the La Liga season started, Alvaro Morata, you weren't sure what he's going to deliver. The guy just scored two goals. And you know what happens when Ronaldo and him are in the same presence? It doesn't really work out. You don't yeah. need him, given the, the attacking talent you have. If you're Simeone, I just wonder if his mind has been changed, given their first week result. Here's what you should do. Just go to Alianza Lima in Peru, and like you'll have a <laughs> great time. You'll have a great time. He'll come. He'll come back with 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 the food. He'll come back thirty pounds <laughs> exactly. overweight because that's, exactly. that's that's that's, that's a good eating. point. This guy doesn't eat anything, so there's no way that he's going to be eating lomo saltado. In <laughs> All right. Well, that was uh, our last point. Before we say goodbye, by the way, make sure to follow at Mike Lahood at John underscore Lagos of CBS Sports. We have plenty of content for you. By the way, Fabrizio Romano. We'll return later in the week. We've got a weekend preview, weekend recap. Uh, Nada. I want to salute our producer. Kanata Edwards, who uh, we're borrowing from uh, our basketball verticals as well, because Des Norris is so lazy. He decided everybody <laughs> to go away. No, I'm just kidding. The hardest working man yeah. at CBS. He deserves his full break. But Nada, you did a great job, buddy. Uh, final thoughts before we say goodbye. Jonathan Johnson. Well, you know, I'm just uh, looking forward to counting the days until Villa are back in action away at Crystal <laughs> Palace this coming weekend. Huge. I'm huge a little bit worried, JJ. I know that we're not going to do this Premier League. Yeah. The Palace look good, man. I mean, mm -hmm. that goal from William Saha, Wilfred Saha against uh, Liverpool uh, it's, good. It's, all, it's all about Sheikh Ducore. you got his number one stand. <laughs> you got his number one stand right here. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. But uh, Mike Lahoud, final thoughts, buddy. Uh, La Liga. That's where I'm putting my energy. I, I loved what I saw from week one. This Barcelona storyline is the gift that keeps on giving. I want to know how, I want to see how many more shares they sell. I was telling Heath Pierce over the weekend, I wouldn't be surprised if they sell the B in Barcelona for a billion dollars and just start going by a different name. They're doing everything they can to generate more money. But the, the, the dark horses in La Liga this season can't wait for the minnows to keep on writing their names in history. This could be a special season. 
Yeah, I well think said. you can. I think you can buy the ice boxes on eBay if you, uh, <laughs> if you get in quick. Well, can you, can you get shares? Because I want shares. Everyone's getting shares of Barcelona. I want shares. <laughs> Everybody, you, it's like that Oprah Winfrey. Gym. Everybody's getting one <laughs> yeah. as well. All right. Well, that was our show, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. As I mentioned, don't forget to follow us at Mike LaHood, at John underscore LaGossip, at LMH Chegaray, CBS Sports. Plenty more que golazo. Listen to me. 20,000 subscribers. I need this before September comes to our door, please. But thank you so much for your support. See you next time. Have a great, great rest of your week. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>